So it is 37, not 27. Okay, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and let me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones and he led me round among them and behold, there were very many upon the valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a note, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, to, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came unto them, and they lived. And they stood upon their feet in an exceeding great host. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. And O oh, my people, and I will bring you home into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O oh, my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, says the Lord. Now, I am going to go to Ephesians 2. Okay? <laughs> Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you he made alive when you were dead through trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the curse of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind, and so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus, Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Be. I am. Uh, I'm going. I first just a little note of explanation here. I'm about to do something that I never do and I don't like. <laughs> I'm about to, to use a video clip. So if you if you love video and you think why don't we do this all the time, don't get too excited. You're going to be disappointed. If you hate video and sermons, so do I. But um, by way of explanation, you know that l just a little background on this. 
Last week, uh, last Sunday on Palm Sunday, we mentioned it in prayers, uh, there were two suicide bombings at two churches in Egypt. One was in the city of Tanta, and the other was in Alexandria. And um, 45 people were killed, 126 people were, were wounded. It could have been much, much worse. In the church in Alexandria, uh, a, a few members of the church, realizing that there was a scuffle outside with the security guards, managed to shut the gate before the suicide bomber could enter. He blew himself up at the gate. He killed the men who shut the gate, but the people inside the church were saved. What I want to show you is an interview. This is from Egyptian television. Don't start it just yet. Don't start it just yet. All right, so this is an interview uh, from Egyptian television um, with the widow and children of a guy named Am Nassim. Am Nassim was one of the men who barred the gate. I was going to describe this to you, but it's just easier to show it to you. And I will, uh, it's in Arabic, I will translate. I'm kidding, I'm going to read, I'm going to read the subtitles. I can't, I can't read, I don't understand Arabic. Uh, but I, I will read them to you so that if you can't see the subtitles, you get it. Um, go ahead and, and turn up the sound if you would. There we go. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm May God forgive me. You. you are not in your right mind. My son believes me. You're just not in your right mind. Believe me, I am not angry. He is now gone, dead. And I ask the Lord to forgive them and let them try to think. Think, think, believe me, if they think, they will know that we didn't do anything wrong to them. Think again, what are you doing? Is it wrong or right? May God forgive you. And we also forgive you. Believe me, I forgive you. You put my husband in a place that I couldn't have dreamed of. Believe me, I am proud of him. And I wish I was there beside him, believe me, and I thank you. This uh, anchor, he, he's, a, he's a Muslim. Aqbat Masr Masnu'in min Fulaz. It says Egyptian Christians are made of steel. Aqbat Masr Egyptian Christians for hundreds of years are bearing many atrocities and disasters. The Egyptian Christian deeply loves his country. القبط المصري يتحمل كل شيء عشان وطنه وايه كميه التسامح اللي عندكم دي لو اعدائكم يعرفوا قد ايه انتم متسامحين بجد ما كانش حد يصدق ده انا لو ابويا والله ما اقول كده ابدا الناس دي عندها كميه تسامح this is their faith and religious conviction. These people are made from a different substance. May God have mercy on Amnesty. He is a hero and martyr. And a greater example for all of us. Everyone who is sitting and criticizing his country about how things are going. This country is moving on by patience, by perseverance, by endurance, by the great woman and her children who have never fought yet lives. Brought up to be men, real men. That's the end of the clip. That was from the Egyptian Bible Society. I probably for copyright purposes, have to tell you that. Um, I thought this was interesting for two reasons. Um, one was the, you know, this is not a unique example of, of forgiveness in the face of, of hatred and violence. This is, this is what we're called to, but also the uh, amazement of the newsreader. Um, because and it's, it's interesting, you, did you hear what he said? He said, uh, the, these people are made from a different substance. Egyptian Christians are made of steel. I would submit to you that he misunderstands what's going on. He's not a Christian, the, the newsreader. He misunderstands what's going on because he, he mistakes their strength for freedom. The ability to forgive, the ability not to be consumed by hatred in the face of hatred, 
is not strength, it's freedom. It is the freedom that was purchased by Jesus on the cross, the freedom that comes from knowing that he is risen and alive. We don't often talk about Easter this way. We don't talk about the resurrection as, as our freedom, but it is. And I'm not making this up. This is the way the Bible speaks of it. This is the way Jesus speaks of it. He says so any number of times through the gospel. According to Luke, for example, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he stood up in the synagogue at Nazareth and he read from the 61st chapter of Isaiah. He read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, uh, just in case people didn't understand what he was getting at, he told them, uh, Luke 4, verse 21, he said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is how Jesus described, at the very beginning of his ministry, how he described what he had come to do. He had come to set the captives free. Eighth chapter of John, eighth chapter of John's gospel, he says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. And he says, and the truth will set you free. At which point, the people who were listening to him objected. They said, we've never been slaves to anybody. And he explained, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the, this is the message of, of Easter, right? This is, this is the core of it. That by willingly laying down his life, for his people. Jesus has freed those who belong to him by faith from guilt, from the power of sin, from the curse that accompanies the sin, and from the threat of judgment and hell. The devil no longer has any authority over you. You belong to Jesus. But that's not it. That freedom spills over. The freedom from guilt and from judgment spills over into other freedoms that you see, for example, in that, the woman in the video there, in her forgiveness. For example, uh, just to name an obvious one, the freedom that we have by the gospel, the freedom that Christ purchased in his blood for us is also the freedom from fear. The freedom from, from fear. What's, it basically boils down to this. What's the worst that could possibly happen to you? Well, short answer is the worst that could possibly happen to you is, is, is death. And not only death, but the death of someone you love. I mean, that's, that's about as deep as it gets. Um, in this woman's case, it was the death of her husband and the, the father of her children. But... Um, but if that's the worst that they can do to you, and if Jesus has risen, you are liberated from that fear. The world no longer has any power over you. I don't know if you caught it when she said it. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, fine. You might say, well, they can cause you a lot of pain in the meantime. I agree, I'm a pessimist. I'm a, I expect the worst, personally. But um, the good news is that in the end... <laughs> Hi, bud. Sorry, that's mine. <laughs> that in, in the end... <laughs> minor aside here. If you feel bad about a kid making noise, mine's going to make more. So don't worry about it. I can talk over them. This freedom, this freedom for which Christ set his people free is the freedom of the knowledge that even death is only for his people a gateway to him, a door to him. Did you hear the, the widow 
in the, in the video, she said um, that the only thing the bomber accomplished in his hatred was to send her husband to Jesus, where she would very much like to be with him. The man who blew, up, blew himself up at that gate had no power over this woman because she had been set free in Christ. See, biblically speaking, this is, the, this is the secret behind it, right? Biblically speaking, we were already dead. We read from Ephesians 2, you were dead in your sins and your transgressions. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. What more can the world do to you? This freedom from, from guilt spills over into freedom from fear. It spills over into freedom from need. If Jesus has done this for you, if this is the love of God for you, that he would give his only son for your sake to lay down his life to purchase your freedom, why would you worry about anything else in the world? <coughs> Ultimately, I know you're going to worry, but why would that worry consume you? Jesus said, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. Spills over into fear from, freedom, excuse me, freedom from loneliness. You don't think of it often. But what's the promise? The promise is I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. To know the love of God in the one who was dead, but who is now alive and seated at the right hand of the Father, is to know freedom from fear, freedom from loneliness, freedom from need, freedom from despair. Despair is one of the devil's most powerful tools. At some point in your life, you are going to be tempted, if you haven't been already, you're going to be tempted to believe that it's too far gone, that there's nothing that can help, that the situation you're in is ultimately desperately flawed and nothing can make it right. The resurrection says no. The resurrection of Jesus Christ says no, it is never so far gone, the situation that it is beyond the grace of God. This is the point that the Lord was trying to make to Ezekiel in chapter 37, not 27. That was probably my fault, sorry. And um, by showing him this valley of dry bones in a vision and, um, and asking him, can these bones live? Ordinarily, what's the answer? Can these bones live? No. <laughs> no, they can't. Normally, the answer is no, they cannot, they're bones, they're dead, it's too late. But with God, all things are possible. Even to put these bones back together and breathe life into them. Um, and finally, oh, by the way, uh, speaking of the video of the woman in Egypt, the Egyptian woman, this freedom that we have in Christ, the freedom of knowing his resurrection, is also freedom from hatred and revenge. <laughs> freedom from the, the need to settle accounts on our own. Part of the reason this is sort of astonishing in an in, in a, in a Arab Muslim culture is because even in, even in the cities in Egypt, um, traditionally th these are cultures of uh, honor and vendetta. So basically, if you hurt my brother, I am now honor-bound to hunt you down and harm you. Accounts have to be settled. But if Jesus is risen, if he is seated at the right hand of the Father, if the world raged against him and could not defeat him, but instead he himself defeated sin and death on our behalf, we don't have to settle scores. We don't have to be consumed, enslaved by hatred and revenge. We can be set free. And finally here, the, the last freedom, and this is the most important one, the freedom that Christ purchased for us in his death and his resurrection. The freedom of Easter is ultimately the freedom to love. The freedom to love God and the freedom to love others. 
I say that. You say, well, you can love God. Can you? Can you genuinely love God apart from the work of Jesus Christ? I don't think you can. That's not just my opinion. (laughs) Um, The problem is that apart from Christ, we don't love God. Apart from Christ, ultimately, we're trying to do it ourselves. We're trying to run our own lives. We're trying to be our own kings and queens. We're trying to save ourselves, and we fail. In Christ, when it's done for us, we're no longer trying to impress or earn points with our Heavenly Father. But we realize simply the the grace and the love with which He has loved us and consequently are free genuinely just to love Him back. And in loving God back, in knowing our forgiveness, to love others. Give thanks today for your freedom. Go home, have ham or whatever you're having. If you can manage to get some lamb, that's pretty good. I'd recommend that. But uh, give thanks to God for the freedom that was purchased for you on the cross and in the resurrection.